All right. You can choose to stand up through the event too, if you want. Um, so I think this, this is, I guess this is the most exciting thing happening tonight in San Francisco. I mean, having, I think over 150 maybe people coming uh, from like over 100 companies just for this event. I was so um, excited about it. And um, um, so I want to take time to give a quick intro about um, San Francisco and your leadership community and then introduce our speakers and the sponsors. So get it started. We'll leave enough time for you to, uh, to networking after the panel, after the, uh, the keynote. So um, don't worry, we'll, we'll have plenty of time. So how many of you, this is your first SFELC event? Wow. wow. This is awesome. So, um, so we have been around actually for two years. Almost exactly two years ago, we started this community. Um, and our first ever speaker is also here. Um, so, and I'm not sure where Dan uh, is right now. So that was almost two years ago. And remember the first event we have uh, 20 people and the second one have like three and a six. So uh, I can't imagine like two years from that time, uh, we can have an event like, like this. So I think when, the reason for people coming here is not only because we have great speakers, not only because we have good food, good vibe, but most importantly is the lack of learning opportunities or the lack of effective ways to help an union leader grow. And that's the only reason, the most important reason for, for people to come in here to, uh, to learn, to connect. And um, so we made a lot of progress in terms of um, building out a community, um, raising awareness across companies, but uh, I think there's still a lot to be done to really address the problem and how, as engineering leaders, how do we, how do we transition from like IC to manager, manager to manager to manager, every step along the way, we're making a lot of mistakes. And, and the thing is, after we start to talking to more people, we start having a frame of reference, we start to realize actually, a big portion of those mistakes are very common across different companies, across you know, different industries. So uh, I think that's the value to get people connected, to really start sharing our experiences. I, I'm sure everyone have, you know, have experiences or have insights that is valuable to other people. And the problem is we're not connected. The problem is that when we have problems, we don't know who to talk to, right? We're not solving problems that nobody, saw, have, nobody have solved before. It's actually, Many people have solved those management problems, leadership problems, is that we don't have that connection when we need those connections, right? We need, when we, lose, we need those uh, um, experiences. So, and that's the purpose of this community. Like, I think we have opportunity, with the momentum we built, there's opportunity for us to uh, really do something valuable to, you know, engineering leaders in the tech industry. So, uh, and we need help from everyone. And that's, that's kind of my pitch. And um, so I'm going to introduce Nick. Nick is a VP, VP of engineering here at a firm. Um, recently, eight months ago, moved from New York City to the Bay Area and had been in New York City forever. Um, <laughs> so uh, expert in the, in the banking industry. So I'm going to give to Nick to sort of introduce a firm who's our you know, sponsor today. Uh, we won't have this event without their support. So thank you. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for coming. We're so excited to use our space for such an amazing event. Um, how many? I'll be very quick because I want to give the microphone to our keynote speaker and uh, and the panel later on. But how many people know what we do at a firm? All right, all right, not enough. Uh, so I'll do. I'll be quick. The uh, so our firm is a uh, we're a fintech startup. We uh, provide credit at the point of sale and integrate with the merchants and we use a lot of very cool technologies and we are growing very quickly. Um, the Probably one of the biggest areas of growth is uh, our merchants, our consumers. Uh, we expand it into new markets and into new products. So um, we're looking for talent, engineering talent across the board. 
uh, from grads to seasoned engineering managers. And recently we announced that we expand into the East Coast, so we hire in New York City as well. So uh, as you guys walk around the, the room today and you see people in these t-shirts, please uh, do tag them and reach out and ask more questions. Uh, I think Nipun is the only one wearing a color shirt, but um, there he is. Uh, so, um, He's running a very cool project, ask him about it. Uh, so we are uh, really excited to have uh, everyone here. And I hope that, um, you know, through the panel, we'll give a little bit of color about, uh, as Jerry was saying, there is leaders from variety of uh, industries. Um, so to me personally, it's very interesting moving from New York, where most of the engineering work that's done is primarily in the financial space, coming here to Silicon Valley, the, it's eye-opening how many uses and applications of engineering is here and how different leadership styles are and uh, opportunities that you can apply and grow in variety of dimensions. So hopefully through, through the talk that Wade's gonna give and through the questions you guys can ask the panel, uh, we can start the conversation about it and uh, hope you join the space. Uh, we're actually, unfortunately, moving out of the space in about six weeks to even bigger space, but so please don't trash it on the way out. Uh, but uh, yeah, enjoy the event and uh, over back to Jerry. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. And um, next, I'm going to give it to, to Matt. Uh, Matt is a senior, senior director at Credit Karma. And uh, he's also one of our very first speakers. Um, and Credit Karma helped us a lot in the past. They host our events twice. And, uh, and for today's event, the, it's our sponsor to provide additional food and make it possible to have you know, multiple devices to help people to check in quickly. So I'm going to give to Matt. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so. I get to give you guys our, our pitch too. Um, if you haven't been over the Credit Karma space, uh, we're hosting meetup groups all the time. John's meetup group's gonna be there in two months, Growth Engineering. Uh, it's awesome, we've done a bunch of those talks too. Uh, we're really passionate engineering leaders at Credit Karma, and I've been there almost three years now, and in those three years I went from managing eight people to almost 70. And one of those awesome things about working at chaotic hyper growth companies like a firm and Credit Karma and Twitter, uh, is we get to get all these experiences in such a short period of time. You really accelerate your own growth as much as the company's accelerating its growth. I know uh, Scott Schumacher, one of our stellar VPs of engineering is gonna be talking on the panel tonight. And uh, he and I, as well as a couple other people from Credit Karma are always looking for people who are excited to jump into the chaos of a hyper growth company and sort of uh, grow with us, uh, get those experiences. And uh, we're glad you're here tonight. Hopefully there's enough food and enough devices to check in. It looks like we got a lot of people in the room. So I'll give it over to Wade here. And uh, thank you, everybody. So I'd like to take a second to uh, introduce uh, Wade. So Wade is our return speaker. So he gave a talk last year in February and uh, it's very, very popular. It's very valuable and also grateful that how we to uh, be able to share his the learnings the wisdom he accumulated over his career in many years uh, i had the opportunity to talk to him um a long time ago um like two years a year and a half ago it's been one hour and that one hour i learned i think i learned more than what i learned in the past several years i mean i'm not exaggerating so the uh, the way he presented a, well it's a framework and also its principles and uh, uh, how to think leadership. So I hope you all learn as much as, much as I did. Um, so Wade was, you know, have been holding engineering leadership position in many, many companies, starting from Opsware, Yahoo, and Telpart, and Twitter, and I became a, a executive in residence at Greylock, and recently, actually today, a, the news came out. Um, so we just joined a new company as a, a Gwen Rounds as a CTO and as APF engineering. So I'm um, super excited to have Wade here to, uh, again, to, to share his wisdom and uh, hope you enjoy it. Thank you. I, d does this work? Can everybody hear me? Oh, okay. Because I know if I hold that, everybody in the front row is in a dangerous position. Um, 
It, it, it was really interesting. So like, I, I think you can tell bald, old, gray hair. Uh, I've been around a while. But John Burt, uh, who's in the back of the room, uh, worked with me back in 1994 in a little startup down in, in the South Bay. And the reason I bring him up is it brought back painful uh, memories. I almost went into a fetal position. Uh, and, and the thing was, is like, I was working there, I was an IC, I was doing fairly well, right? Like all of the projects I was working on, I kept getting shoved to the front uh, of the project and sort of being a tech lead. And then I started working on things that were sort of the foundation for a lot of what was being built. Uh, and one day, the CEO wanders by and he's like, should I do the accent? No, I won't do the accent. Uh, you should be a manager. And I'm like, holy shit. The CEO has recognized my greatness. I should be a manager. It's my life's calling. The CEO himself came down to tell me. You're right, I should be a manager. I didn't even change my shoes. The next day came back in, I was a manager. It was awesome uh, and nothing changed, right? I got to do all the things I kept, uh, was doing before, uh, but now I had control of people and I could like give them raises or I could hire new people or I could do all those sort of things. And the weirdest thing happened, like two months later, somebody quit. And then another person quit. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? Right, like it's going so well. And I had a senior engineer that took me aside and he's like, dude, you suck. <laughs> uh, and, and he's like, um, do you know how many times you come in and tell us about your ideas and delegating who should be working on what and why and what your design is and, and all of those sort of things. Uh, and when's the last time you gave me any fit, feedback? Well, how am I growing a, as an individual? And it was just like hitting a wall full force running uh, with, you know, not even looking. You know, it, it hurt. But you recognize truth when it's given to you. Uh, the next day, same shoes. I'm back to being an IC because, like, I did not want to screw up. Uh, painful. Like, really, really painful for me personally. Uh, and I was an IC again for a few more years until I had the benefit of actually working with Ben Horowitz um, at Netscape. Um, and again, same pattern, doing well, out in front of the projects, leading, and Ben wanders by and he's like, you should be a manager. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I know this one, right? Like, I know how this ends. This is not good. We're, we're stopping here right now. He's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, and I told him ab about the, um, the, the story I had previously and, and how badly I sucked. And he's like, has anybody ever talked to you about management and like what it actually means to be a good manager? And I'm like, oh, that's a thing? Uh, and, and he's like, okay, um, ha do you have a mentor? Like somebody who, who's helping and coaching and, and growing you through these, uh, these stages? And I'm like, that's a thing too? Uh, and he's like, okay, <laughs> you've been raised by wolves. Um, <laughs> come, let's talk about this. Uh, it was profoundly different the second time through, right? Like um, I was given challenges that allowed me to progress. I was given coaching. I was, I, I, I was progressed through the stages, uh, not perfectly. Um, and, but like, it was interesting. Like there's this inflection point at that point in time where things dramatically changed for me. And so I oftentimes refer to uh, my career path looking something like this. But it didn't feel that way as I was going through it, right? Like it felt like I was doing the right next thing and it was purposeful and everything. But like with hindsight looking back, it was nowhere near that. I was running from things, you know, uh, my ego wouldn't support like understanding the truth. Um, you know, I had all these blind spots that I didn't even know were, were things. Uh, and so I, I was constantly working around things. I, I, I did struggle. I finally got there. But I realized, like, in hindsight, it wasn't necessary, right? Like, there was a lot of things that I could have done that would have just streamlined the whole process if I understood, like, what were some of the key aspects of management and leadership and how I can practice those and move through the paces. Uh, and so after a while, I was like, Wade, you are doing a disservice if you don't at least attempt.
to write some of these things down and make them available. It's not going to be perfect. I don't, please don't take this as a recipe. Like, please take this as a beginning, if, if it resonates with you, to explore and to expand and do something with it that, that's your own, right? Like, this is me reflecting back and talking to other engineering leaders about, like, what they've seen as well. Um, you're going to find your own path, um, but I, I, I present it here um, to potentially help you. Okay, so uh, Jerry told me I have 30 minutes. I have 110 slides. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. It doesn't work as well as I thought it was in the wood in my head. Um, let me say this, right? Like engineering management, super, super hard. And if you think about it, right? Like, yes, of course you do all of these things. But if you really think about it, it's not a single discipline, right? There's some anthropology involved. There's some technologists involved. There's some psychology involved. There's lots of other things that you're going to get in e economics, right? Like you, you have to understand the business. There's, there's so many things that you need to become really, really good at. Um, what I have found is that like if you can focus in a few key areas, it forces you to create balance uh, in your career as you move forward. And we're going to talk about each one of these four sections plus the fifth uh, inside of here. Um, I will also say, uh, Ray Dalio has a book out called Principles right now. You think it's going to be preachy, it's not, right? Like I would encourage each and every one of you to, to read it because it actually talks about him trying to define the principles that drive decisions before they happen so that, that he can acid test those as he goes through. And the more that you think about your career and your organization in the same way, you can start to think about like how to capture those things. And as you go through, you have goals, you screw up. You learn from that, you diagnose it, you design the answer, and you continue to do it. I actually think it expands beyond that. How many of you know how to brew beer? Okay, there's a few, so count yourselves out. If I, if I was to say, like, I want you to brew a Russian Imperial Stout this weekend, everybody, most people would be like, yeah, no. I just moved you from being unconsciously incompetent to now being very consciously incompetent. Does that mean that you can't brew beer? No, right? Obviously, you can learn it. How do you learn it? Well, I get to declarative knowledge. I, I read a blog. I, I watch a video. I have a friend who does it. I get to a point where I can talk about it. Well, that's nice. That makes you dangerous. The problem is a lot of people stop there. Well, what if you continued on? What if you actually tried to put it into action? And I started to do it. Well, it's clumsy the first time. And a lot of people don't like feeling incompetent, but if you do it and you work through it and you do it a second time and a third time and a fifth time and a 10th time, well, now all of a sudden you get practiced at it and it starts to not feel as bad. And when you get there, you stop thinking about it after a while, that's called skill, right? And so if you get on the other side of it, you go through the conscious competence all the way through to the unconscious competence. And now that you, you have that, right? Like you can focus on the next thing. The more that you can line things up and knock down the next one, you move faster as you go through your career. I will say this, right, like as I present these things, um, I'm going to present them very matter-of-factly. It's not easy, right? Simple is, is not easy, and, and it's going to take a lot of work to, to, to work through it. Okay, let's get in. Uh, how many of you watch this, this movie? Okay, excellent. I was so afraid. I'm going to throw out them. People are going to be like, I don't get it, and I'm going to be like, fill out your TP. No. Uh, anyhow, okay, if you've watched this movie, this guy was like a total dweeb. Uh, the pointy haired boss, like everybody hated. But if the Peter principle holds true, he was really, really good at his last job. Just like I was good at my job, John, shut up. Um, <laughs> and uh, then you hit your level of incompetence and it doesn't work. And, and why? Well, you get promoted based on how you did in your last job, not by evaluating the job that's, uh, that's needed, what are the characteristics of that job and evaluating you against that? Okay, so if you keep going through that, you're eventually going to hit this point of where like, I'm gonna keep doing what I was doing before me uh, because that's what worked. And unfortunately, that's not the thing that the new job needs. And so you kind of have this expectation. Career assumptions are going to take you from a tech lead down on the bottom side all the way up to being a VP of engineering. Well, it kind of doesn't work that way, right? Like, well, you have to go through um, all of the various stages and you start at a SWE 1 and you go all the way up to, and SWE 1, yeah, you got to earn your salary. SWE 2, uh, okay, now I got to own something. I can go a little bit deep. I can go a little bit wide. I can drive things. I start to contribute outside of myself. I contribute to the team. 
Well, a senior engineer, actually, that's a shot of adrenaline, right? Like they can come in uh, and they can change the, the trajectory of, a, of a, a project, right? Like they have the ability to win and lead constantly to winning. They can solve problems. They can help move things forward. Staff engineers can do that at a much higher level. I should be able to almost take any problem that exists in a business and hand it to a staff engineer and know that they will take it from a very vaguely formed problem to something that's working in production uh, and do it in a way that like is going to make you proud of it. Um, senior staff, I'm not going to dwell on this, but like senior staff is like a director of product management. They can look out 24 months, know where you're trying to go, work backwards from that and crawl, walk, run your way into success. If you think about everything that I just went through, people who are uh, extremely good at this, their success is largely built on like, how do I apply knowledge uh, to technical problems and help them come out the other side? Well, if you kind of project that onto your first management, uh, you know, you're gonna start here and that's your starting point. You're going now, you're going to be an engineering manager and, and walk in. Uh, and you're gonna start going through the paces and a lot of times that tech lead will help you go through the first engineering manager role and sometimes into the second, uh, the senior engineering manager role. But about the time you hit the director role, you're starting to feel like you're not making the progress that you intended to make or, and that you know that you're capable of. Like you're smart, you're motivated, you're working your ass off and yet you're spinning. So like, you know, how do you get there? And then you start to recognize this lack of, of progress and you start, you know, this organization is so political. My boss just does not recognize like what I truly bring to the table. Um, look, I, I've looked at Jill. Jill is not that good at X. I am so much better than Jill at X. Right, like, so why aren't you measuring me like that? Well, like all of these things are just blatantly flawed, right? It's looking for an answer outside of yourself as opposed to like figuring out like what's the thing that's holding you back and working through it and you get stuck, right? And so if you were to look at it from a different perspective, if you had this spectrum of, you know, the bell curve of from like truly outstanding to truly needs improvement, the thing that you would want to do is to say, okay, look at the level above me. I wanna find the middle of that. Like, let me find the 51st percentile of the grade above me. And of all of the, in all of the areas that matter, do I compare favorably, right? Don't find the weakest person to measure yourself against. Measure against where the, the, the center uh, of the next is. And then you can say, look, I'm deserving of being an X because if I measure myself against everybody else that's in that general area, against the things that matter, I compare favorably. You have an argument to make there. Focus on, on getting there as opposed to trying to find the weakest of the pack and make a case against them. Won't dwell on that slide, but it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing when you're going through uh, and you were a, an amazing engineer and like we are valued based on competence. We're valued based on being able to apply brain power to a problem. We're, we're, we, we like that sense of winning. And when you step out and you're not doing that, right? Like it just feels bad. And for you to accept the responsibility of that is super hard, right? Like, and I am standing up here as somebody who uh, resisted it for a long time. Um, but I can say like every time you start to focus on something that's outside of yourself, just stop. All right. So let's go about it in a different way. So obviously you, you need to kind of understand what these different areas are. Uh, real research says one out of 10, uh, managers that get into the role naturals. They don't even have to try. It just kind of works for them. They have all of the qualities that, that just seem to, to make them godlike in, in some way. I wish I was one of those. It didn't work out that way. Two out of uh, 10 with practice become mediocre. 
oh crap, you know what that means? It's like 70% of the people uh, don't work out, right? They have that same experience that I had uh, and they are a reject and they get flushed um, and, and they go on to be bitter, grumpy senior engineers that uh, you don't go near their corner. <laughs> Oh, good, Jerry. Thank you for coming up front. Now I can see the signs. Jerry's already looking at me like, you're going to go way over. I am here to stop you. <laughs> okay, so why does that 70% uh, fail? Uh, I feel like Bob Barker. Number one reason is, um, like, but think about uh, how you got into management. Think about other people that have wanted to get into management. Like, these are the things that I always hear. Um, it's because I'm doing so well, Peter Principal, uh, or do you really want to, this is a really difficult time, do you really want to entrust uh, this project to somebody who doesn't know where all the bodies are buried? Okay, they don't see it as an entirely different role, like I was talking about, right? Like I just saw it as an extension of my current role. Um, I think the, the right way of thinking about it is a total career restart. And so I think that uh, fundamentally, like you need to answer you know, what is your job? People talk about like, oh, it's hiring or it's running the, the scrum or, or it's all of these types of things. Let me roll it up in the way that I think about like what your job. It's to win and it's to increase your capacity to win, right? Like it is to generate business value for the company. And if you're not doing that, you are focusing on actually improving uh, your team's ability to do even more in the future. Like a year from now, you should be able to do 150% of what you've got with the same people. Not because they're working 150% more. You've had a year to focus on training, tools, process, uh, coaching, growing people, all of those sorts of things. You should be able to be significantly further ahead than, than where you're at today. Um, everything else is how you do one of those two things. And so if I go back to this slide and you're thinking about all these things, they factor into how you're going to, to do those things. If you fast forward a year and you think about whether you're winning or not, like you should really think about it as, and I know there's a lot of words on this slide, but uh, it's determined to, by your ability to have sustained recognized wins via the team while improving the velocity without any of the negatives. That's a big, tall order. And so that's why I bring it up. It, it's not something to be taken lightly. You actually have to work through the things that, that will make those uh, true statements. Uh, another part, reason, main reason why they fell is, I love this. I, I made this up, can you tell? <laughs> they don't embrace their suckedness and they retreat to competence, right? Like it, it, it's this thing of, I don't like feeling bad, so I'm gonna move backwards to where I knew I was strong and you're going to evaluate. And I love Ray's uh, quote uh, about like your biggest obstacles, uh, when you, especially when you get into this role, your blind spots and your ego. And there is nothing that's going to shine a light on you brighter than stepping into a management role and needing to help others. All right, uh, so with that, uh, Google survey about like what great managers do. And they spent a lot of time and money uh, like trying to figure this out in internally. Interesting, technical competence, where's it at on this list? Hmm, interesting. All right, so you are choosing incompetence, right? Like I'm overstating, of course, uh, but like you are choosing to say like all of these things that are going to make me very good in this new role I don't have them or I have some portion of them. I need to go acquire these. I need to go build these skills. I need to, to grow uh, these things moving forward. And most people, they just retreat uh, to competence. Don't do that, right? Like it, that's easy to say. Uh, struggle with building new skills. Um, I'm going to fast forward through these. By the way, like there's a lot of extra slides in here because I wanna make the slides available. You can go read through it at your own leisure. So if I skim over some slides, it's not because I don't think they're important because you'll be able to have the ability to read them later. How am I doing? What time? Okay, I'm at 20 minute mark. All right, so obviously, I think the more that you can identify your blind spots and the more that you can address sort of ego issues, then you can actually work through. What do I need to know? How do I get to that declarative knowledge? So many resources out there. I've, we've never rich, lived in such a rich point in time where almost anything that you wanna know about, almost anything you wanna know about is available to you. 
One of the coolest things about Silicon Valley and the, the whole Bay Area, um, if you want to know something, the, the best chances are that you can go find somebody um, who knows a lot about it and ask them, and they would be excited to tell you about it. Right? Like, I, 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 the number of times I've been turned away when I've wanted to go find something out, it's just like on a hand. You know, it, it's, it's insignificant over the over. Uh, the long term. So, like, go ask, find people who are very knowledgeable in a space. They're going to be happy to tell you about it. And if not, they've written it down, or it's available in book form, or it's in a video somewhere. Uh, but you can go find it. Once you've done that, go through the steps. Right? It's going to be awkward at first. Try and apply it. Um, actually, work through the practice. Uh, get feedback. Listen to it. Do all of the work necessary to turn it from something that's awkward to something that's comfortable to something that you don't even have to breathe hard when you do it anymore. Uh, I think that the more that you can if sort of follow through this and, and like each time you hit a problem area, it's a good signal for you, right? Like follow the pain. It's like, why do, why does this feel so bad, right? Like, I just don't want to do it. I just want to avoid it. No, like pay extra attention to that. If you can do that and you can spot those signals, you can pause, you can choose like, is this uh, one, is it a symptom or no? What's the real issue? You can go and address the real issue. You can build the skills necessary to actually work through that. So how do you change your odds of being that, that, that 10%? Um, so number one is, I'm not going to focus on this, but like I love the idea of luck, um, but directed motions where it's at, right? Like Elon Musk is the, the, the greatest example of this, of where like he knows where he wants to be, and he knows the things that are going to help him get there, and he's just constantly chipping away at that and, and moving through it. And I think the more that you can apply that to your own career, the, the better off you are as well. And so for that, um, if you don't start with yourself and get your head in the right spot, you're screwed, right? Like if you think that you're just gonna walk through and, and like present data and everybody's just gonna jump on board and it's going to be miraculous, uh, you are just fooling yourself, right? Like you have to get your head in the right spot. You have to be there for your team. You have to give a shit personally, uh, and you have to act that way. Um, so let's dive in through these. And so I'm going to start uh, as you go through this. Uh, I'm not going to do that. You can read this on your own time. Um, let's go to right there. Care personally. Um, I have a lot of people who approach leadership and management as an academic exercise, right? It's like, oh, there are these steps and communication. And I understand the three V's around communication. And if I practice this a little bit, I will have good communication skills and then I'll focus on the next thing. And like they go through the motions. Have you ever gotten good at something that you had a casual or academic ex um, interest in? If you don't give a shit about the people on your team, they feel it. If you are not personally committed to being awesome in all of these different roles, you're not gonna make it through. You have to commit to being on the other side of this. You have to commit to being good enough in each one of these areas that it's not going to hold you back with your team and your team deserves the best, right? Like you personally have to care about each one of these areas. And it, it's not that you sitting here today, it has to be uh, innate in you, right? These things can be learned. You can get on the other side of these things by actually learning more about optimism. You can learn about what's necessary. But if you don't care about people, you're gonna have to get to where you care about people and it's going to need to feel that way on a day in day out basis. And if you're faking it, it it's not gonna come across as authentic or genuine. Let's talk about driving outcomes. Um, this is the stuff that most everybody in this room already knows. And so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but it's like all of this stuff, backlog grooming. It is how do you get things out the door that need to be uh, done? Uh, it is everything that's on here and more, and there's lots of different uh, books and resources available that allow you to sort of focus on different aspects of management and getting to where you want to be. Right, and it's also this uh, idea that like you can go through and look at the overall process and where's effective time, where's ineffective time. That's your job, right? Like to remove all of it from, remove all the grist from the machine, make it run more efficiently. 
uh, if we were to get into focusing on improving how you think, like this is a big one, right? Like this forces you to look at yourself in a way that like you can understand your blind spots, you can understand your growth areas, you can understand where ego is getting in the way and you have to consistently focus on idea meritocracy, getting to the best solution as opposed to looking good. Um, if you are concerned about how somebody's seeing you, that's a wasted thought, right? Like focus on getting to the right solution and driving to the right outcome and, and identify the things that are getting in the way of that. And it can be you and it could be something else, uh, but like you have to get on side of the other side of that. To that end, right? Like you have to um, put into practice how to see things differently. You consistently have to apply first principles thinking to make sure that you can get better at diagnosing what the actual problem is, coming up with better answers for that and helping to carry it out. First principles thinking is a great way of doing it. Critical reasoning skills, understanding like what you're projecting onto an issue, where your experience is limited, where somebody else's experience is much greater and figuring out how to pull them into talking about the, uh, uh, the subject. Uh, figuring out your blind spots. Like there's plenty of different places out there where you can go and say, um, is this an area of strength or like, whoa, okay, if, I, if I'm weak in here, I need to get better. Or I also need to have somebody on my team that can help address that um, instead of me like trying to bullshit my way through it. Um, you need to create leverage in, inside of the team. Uh, the more that I think your team understands like why you're making a decision and how you're making a decision, guess what? They can do it in your absence. And the more that you can be purposeful about everybody understanding those same things, uh, the more that you don't have to be involved in every discussion. If you're trying to control every aspect of your organization, I guarantee you, you're not. Um, having people understand the reasoning behind, behind things allows them to act differently when you're not in the room. Like you need to be good at changing the way that you think so that you can get to like the why behind things. Uh, it also extends into the business side of things, right? Like I have so many people that I know that, you know, well, product management gives me uh, the requirements and I go faithfully execute to that. <laughs> no, right? You have to apply back pressure. You have to improve the quality of thought. You need to be a good partner to, to your peers. You need to understand like where's the leverage and how do you best take it to market? Right? It doesn't have to originate with you, but you need to be able to go through those conversations and add value to the entire uh, conversation. Um, if you don't understand uh, the four steps to an epiphany, if you don't understand how you do um, customer uh, development, customer discovery, right? Like spend time, understand how markets work, understand how you bring products uh, to light, like, it's, it's just eye-opening and, and helps you in your career. Um, I will also say that like as you move up in your career, right, like you will spend a lot of time early on thinking about like how does the project win? As you move up, you're going to be thinking about like how does the company win? And I need to diagnose like what's going wrong inside of the company so that I can help it. Not your job all the time or not your function all of the time, it's definitely your job. And so improving how you think as you go up, you'll take on bigger and bigger problems that, that span lots of different departments. Uh, and it's, it's a byproduct of how you think. Let's talk about um, team versus function. So a lot of people, when I say team, as an IC, it's really simple. It's the people I work with. The funny thing is, is that when you become a manager, you continue to identify with the team that you work with as opposed to your peers. Right? Somehow the logic changes and the reality is it is the peers that you work with, right? That product manager is on your team, right? The, the QA manager is on your team. Uh, the uh, UX uh, team is on your team, right? Like the, those are your team. Your function is the group that, that uh, reports to you and how you get things done inside of it. It's really, really important to understand this because as you go up, what I see is a lot of people try and defend their team as opposed to like understand like how their function can be brought to solve the, the, the business problems that are out there. You have to think about it uh, differently um, as you, you move forward. Um, 
Okay, so if you haven't read this, it's a great thing to sort of teach you about uh, team versus function. Uh, Hugh Deberly at Netscape actually came up with this diagram. And the whole point is, is like there's a, one portion of it, which is uh, what do people want and how do you best give that to them? What builds a sustainable business and how do you build it in an extensible way? There has to be tension between each one of those areas. It has to be creative, practical ways of debating and moving through those things. Uh, but there has to be tension. It can't be that like you just are waiting for the inbound, right? You have to go engage your partners and your, your team um, across things, or you know, you're, you're just subservient to other parts of the business. Uh, the whole um, form, storm, norm, and perform. You have to understand how to move people through this cycle. Uh, you have to understand how to find the right people, how to hire them, how do you find people that are actually going to multiply value inside of your team. If you've got a team and you've got quality problems, hmm. Do you have a lot of cowboys on the team that are actually trying to introduce new change in, into the environment all the time? Oh, interesting. Okay, if you've got zero problems inside uh, of the code base and it's just stable, and yet you're trying to get, figure out how to move faster, like, like look inside of the makeup of the team. Do you have a lot of in introverts? Well, I bet you it's low energy. Do you have too many extroverts? Well, I, feel, I bet you it feels like you're not getting traction as much as you should. There's so many different ways that like personalities and how they come to the role like impact their ability uh, to, to help inside of the team. It's your responsibility to buy, build the culture, build the ecosystem that produces great results in, inside of the, the team. How the team talks, how the team behaves, right? Like it's your job to like try and figure out how to unlock that. There's plenty of ways and uh, ability uh, to, to get to this. Um, I am fast forwarding, coaching individuals, uh, there's a thing, right? Like if, if teams are all about anthropology and understanding how a bunch of humans work together to, to uh, figure out something, uh, coaching, it's about psychology. Everybody comes uh, with their own mix, right? And you have to meet them where they're at, right? It can't be like you've got one size fits all uh, in sort of how you're gonna teach or how you're going to coach, but right? you have to meet them based on where their motivation is at and what they're trying to achieve and figure out how to get inside of that to to unlock it. Uh, and then you have to put together a development plan that actually works for them and where they're trying to go and give them access uh, to opportunity to practice those, those things. Radical candor, I love this book. Um, do you care enough to get past the discomfort and to give people practical applied feedback of where they feel like you care about them and are trying to unlock them? Uh, I'm not gonna read all of these. Um, and I know that I'm over time, so I am going to skim. Uh, I will say that think about like how you measure your teams. Output, level of responsibility, level of impact. It works for almost any position you can have. Uh, in terms of output, how they do it, how much they do it. In terms of responsibility, how much can you give without impacting the output of the organization? Well, I've only got 100% of my time. You gave me twice as much work. No, the point is, is can you figure out how to do the things that truly matter? Delegate in some cases, not do certain things, uh, et cetera. A bunch of people actually finish what's on their plate and it doesn't have any impact. Uh, the more that you can figure out how to improve how you think, you start to focus on the things that actually do generate real value for the company long-term uh, and the impact increases. If you have a problem in any one of those areas, you can generally map it back to a job-related skill or competency, a personal skill or a competency, um, or an interpersonal skill. Personal competency, self-awareness, self-control, motivation. You can dig into each one of those on your own time. Plenty of text around that. Interpersonal skills, two areas. Social awareness, can you read the room? Can you read, read the team? Do you understand what's going on? How decisions get made? Okay, that's a very different set of skills than can you move the pile? Can you influence? Can you lead? Can you teach? Communication skills, all of those sort of things come in. The more that you can help people on your team understand where they're at and where their discrepancies are, uh, the better off you can uh, get to. So we went through this before, but I actually go through and start to uh, chart this out so that I can say like, where, where is somebody limited and, and where they're at? And so like you can go through each one of the skills or each one of the positions and sort of say where things are at. If I was to look at the engineering leadership matrix, 
This is incomplete, but I wanted to try and do something that in each one of these areas gave you sort of a, a view on like where you should be and how you ladder up and how they all factor, uh, how the rubric works over and over again. So again, you don't need to read this right here right now. Uh, you'll be getting a, a copy of this deck. Not that bad over. Not bad at all. Okay, so uh, do we have time for questions or do we need to move on to the next thing? Yeah, we have oh. Uh, we'll have a time for questions. Um, let's do, uh, I think we can do seven minutes question. And then I know even if we do 20 minutes questions, it won't be enough. I, I know you have a lot of questions for it, but um, we're going to stay beyond the panel discussion till the end of the event. So we have more time to, yeah. to ask questions afterwards. Yeah. Right. And so, and, and I know that I just did the quick skim uh, each one of these areas. Uh, Dan was uh, very kind to me and he's like, Wade, each one of these like is an hour long presentation and you know, you could talk about each one of these in, in depth. Uh, and I was like, no, nah, it's way too important. I got to squeeze it all in. Uh, so apologies, but like, if there's anything I can answer right now, we'd love to do that. Yes. Yes. So if you're looking to promote, if you were looking to promote somebody and you were actively trying to avoid the Peter principle, what do you look for in an IC that lets you know this person is going to be a good manager? So the, 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 the same way that I think that you would talk about, like, what do you need? Um, like very specifically at Grand Rounds, brand new company to me, and we have some manager roles that, that are open internally. And I'm looking at it saying like, okay, based on where the project is at and where we need to be a year from now, like what does success look like? Okay, if that's the case, then let me make sure that I understand what are the competencies that we need to look for that are best going to produce that outcome that we want and then how do we interview for it? And so I'd look through each one of these areas to go like, you know, what's the current state of the team? Um, what is, um, uh, you know, like do, does, does the team function well, like is coaching a big thing, et cetera? And then I would actually talk to the IC that's looking to get into management uh, then is thinking about that role. And we would have a conversation about where they're currently at in each one of these skills versus what's needed in the role. And we'd be having a conversation about how we can accelerate, accelerate their learning to be able to get uh, ready for that. Or maybe they're comfortably over that line and then I can have that conversation about like, let me help you understand what management means. Uh, and then if, if they get it and they're aligned with it and they're clearly um, uh, competent in enough of those areas, then we can actually uh, move forward with it. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how to phrase my, uh, my question. I spent most of my life avoiding uh, self-help books, but it was self-help books that led me first into, oh, there's all these things about people that other people have run into before, and it turns out they have insight into. Um, you, you named a lot of books in your presentation. How did you come across these books? How do you find useful resources for these kinds of, this kind of knowledge? Yeah, so, so one is, um, it, it, it's about me, but like, uh, grew up in a very poor family, didn't go to college, and so like I was always afraid that people were going to see me through a certain light. And so as opposed to exposing my ignorance um, about a particular topic, uh, every time that I got fearful about something, I would look for a book that I could go read and acquire the knowledge as quickly as I could, or at least be able to get to that declarative knowledge that I could talk about it. And so I just got into that habit very early on uh, about like, I don't understand that. What the hell are they talking about to go read a book to like, okay, that makes sense. Let me look at some code or let me go try and do these things. Um, now, as I do it, uh, when I have painful areas, I do two things. One is like, who's the most believable person that I know on the topic and let me go talk to them. How did they get good at it and what would they recommend? So that's how I, I largely get into books um, now based on uh, references. Uh, and if I don't find somebody that I think is a believable resource on that, then I'll actually go look at it, um, look on Amazon, look at, at ratings, do a couple of queries. But I'm trying to find people that um, either give reviews and are commenting on things that are similar to, to the experience that I'm having um, or something on the back jacket, you know, talks to the same sort of thing. Yes. Oftentimes we talk about 
engineering management as some new thing, but uh, managing has been around for a long time and managing engineers has been around for a long time. Are there any parallels that you've seen from other fields uh, that apply to engineering management? The, the, the great part is, is like, you know, I, I know a lot of people that I, I truly respect that are in other disciplines uh, and I've given them sneak peeks at, at this deck and they're like, there's nothing about engineering management in this with the exception of like the one little section about execution and you had a bunch of engineering centric books. It's generally, it works across um, all the different disciplines. And so, yeah, you're right. There's, there's nothing particular to, to engineering for most of it. It's just common patterns. Back in the back. Senior architects and the like. Um, do you have any specific strategies for dealing with these highly technical pointy people that may not be so interested in the big picture or other things like that? Yeah, no, it, it, it's a valid question, right? Like we've all uh, worked with uh, the guy who kind of looks like me but has a really long ponytail. Um, hey, I wish I had a really long ponytail. Um, uh, but like they're, they're gruff. And, and the real question is, is like, um, is there something that you can do that sort of unlocks them? And so like, can you give them the feedback? Can you wrap it as a gift and like genuinely mean it as a gift as opposed to a, a punch in the nose, but say like, hey, I think we're, we're trying to accomplish the, the same thing, but every time I, I say X, like you start defending. And so I might be saying something wrong that, that's raising that. I was wondering if you could give me some feedback on a better way of, of setting this up because you are one of the, the, the people that has the most level of knowledge on this. I wanna fully take advantage of that, right? Like, can you give it in a gift that, that helps get past the ego and, and the you're treading on my turf? Um, and you can try that a couple of different ways and see if you can get on the other side of it. Uh, what I found is like, there's some that, yeah, no, like once you can expose it to them, they'll meet you with, with where you're at as long as you're coming with honorable um, intent. Uh, the flip side is there are some people that you just have to um, accept that uh, the person you just met is who they are. In that case, then you have to figure out how to uh, leverage them for what they are and, and, and where they're at. Um, if that's the only thing that you can do, if they're that critical to, to the business. Um, I will say that in, in my world, right, like it's pretty rare that I want somebody who is this stodgy, grumpy old person that's not going to actually create value on a broader sense uh, because I don't have special projects that I can just take to the Oracle all the time, right? Like I want people who are going to help lead in, in net new directions. And so I, I will move people out of the organization to make room for people who I think can actually do heavier lifting in a way that's more aligned. So it's, it's contextual, of, of course. I would say start with the gift um, and figure if that, out if that works. And then if not, figure out how to leverage them for where they're at if you have to. Uh, let's take one last question, but this time from, uh, from this side. So what do you think, uh, how hands-on should, should a successful manager be? How involved in day-to-day -day coding and doing, you know, things of that nature should a successful manager be? Or does that depend on the size of the team? Uh, so I would say, what does it take to win? Um, so the, the thing that I found is like, one, if you're going to improve your capacity to win, uh, is you are going to be somewhat limited if your hands are always on the keyboard. Um, so if you have a team of 10, can I focus on actually create, increasing the velocity of each one of those 10 by 10%? Well, I get to you know, much more dramatic returns than if I'm constantly like, I don't have time to do that. Instead, I need to belt this out all of the time. There's exceptions all the time, right? And there's some cases of where you need to roll up your sleeves and actually get in. Uh, I think you always have to be able to give task relevant feedback. If you can't go to the metal when you're an SVP of engineering, like you've kind of lost touch and you're gonna lose credibility with your team. You need to be able to get into it, um, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be day in, day out um, inside of the code. So I would say that when it's a small team, um, you know, you're probably gonna be a little bit more hands-on. As the team grows and scales, your time is probably better spent on all the things that I suggested up here as opposed to like, figuring out the next um, algorithm, if, if anything, right? Like 
figuring out how to coach one of your people to do that is probably much more highly leveraged time spent. Okay, last one. But uh, if there are things that you would like to, to, to ask, um, I'm gonna stick around, so I, I'd be excited to, to talk about it with anybody who actually wants to talk about it. All right, oh, that's thanks, it. Wade. Uh, thanks. I think we should give him a, a round of applause. Feel bad to cut it off and you know have to no. yeah. Um, so let's face topic. So we're gonna have a uh, ten minutes focusing on um, you know if you're hiring or looking. I know a lot of people. It's a good opportunity to to connect. And um, so what we'll do is so we'll starting from our speakers. So if they have open positions, to quickly pitch it. And then if you're interested, you're not speaker you're interested, just you know you can line up here. So we'll you know, do as much as possible within 10 minutes and then we'll switch to the panel discussion. So, um, do you have any like open position for engineering leaders? Um, so how, we can start with Wade and then other speakers, you can uh, come up here and then we'll do the rest of people. I'm also a mic stand. Uh, so just joined Grand Rounds. Um, it is a company, so, I've worked at a lot of companies where I thought we did great work, um, but I don't know that it actually moved the, the world forward in a positive way. Uh, Grand Rounds actually has successfully built products that genuinely help people find the care that they need. And they, use it, uh, they do it by using data science and understanding physicians um, and who has, by the way, like just, there's a bell curve with doctors as well. Right, and there's that 10% that are outstanding, there's 25% that are excellent, and then there's another 65% that your, your mileage may vary, right? And, and, and so I just, it's incredible how many times I talk to people and they're like, my mom, my dad uh, had that issue, or my child uh, who I, I needed to get help for, right? Like I got the runaround, or let me put it in a more extreme form, 100,000 people in the United States alone die on an annual basis due to malpractice or misdiagnosis, right? And so if you can use data science to actually improve that as an outcome, right, I think you're making the world a, a better place. Uh, and I think that there's other products that are coming out right now that are equally impactful uh, to the world. And there's like heavy lifting to be done there. We are going to probably double the size of the team uh, in 2018. And, and so, uh, not the reason that I came, but if you are looking for your next thing, and the things that I talked about tonight, you think uh, resonate with you, and, and you see that you wanna grow along those lines, we have openings. So please come talk to me about that as well. All right, um, any, sorry, I assume you have something to say. Hi, man. my name is Soren Harner. I'm with MuleSoft. Uh, our mission at MuleSoft is connect the world's applications, data, and devices. And we do this by allowing our customers to build applications. And we actually have management roles on our team that hosts all of these applications. So if you're interested in building out essentially a PaaS and scaling that up to, to manage you know, hundreds of thousands of integration applications for some of the biggest companies in the world, uh, come find me and talk to me. Uh, we've got some really interesting things. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Uh, anybody else have interesting positions? No? Okay. Hi, I'm Heather Rivers. I'm the head of engineering at Mode Analytics, and we are building a product that will hopefully enable analysts to enable their organizations to make better decisions. And we are hiring engineering managers across the stack. So if you'd like to talk about data analysis tools and uh, what we're up to, uh, come talk to me. Thanks. Hi, my name is Steven. I'm from Slack. Um, you might know what we do, enterprise messaging. You're really mad when we're down. Um, so we have a few manager positions that are open um, to help keep it up. Um, um, specifically, um, if the word, if the acronyms SSO or SCIM uh, mean any, anything to you, uh, enterprise identity management, um, also our Android uh, infrastructure um, needs help, and then um, in our um, general web application. Uh, thanks.
Uh, and by the way, so I saw Steve. Um, so put so there's a well, the app Pem Hub. So uh, there's a sec. No, there's a tab where you can um, post your positions there. So Steve actually posted a few positions there. I noticed it early today. So um, there's a place you can uh, get some attention or browse opportunities. Hi, I'm Dave Rockwerger. Um, I work for Zillow Group. So if any of you have heard of Trulia, Zillow, Street Easy, Real Estate.com. Um, our mission is to help buying and selling houses much easier. Um, so we have a ton of roles, in particular, I'm looking for an iOS manager, Android manager. Um, so if anyone's interested, you know, please reach out to me. Um, hello, my name is Chi Chen, and I come from uh, Intuit, basically TurboTax, QuickBooks, things like that. And this year, we are double down on AI and machine learning. And I'm currently the director of data science, and we are looking for senior manager, group managers. So if you are interested in leading an AI machine learning team, both machine learning engineering and data scientists, please find me, and I'm happy to uh, talk more about uh, our future and our hiring opening. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Egan, and I work at Pinterest. And uh, I'm sure many of you have seen articles about how social media is making people more depressed or more unhappy. At Pinterest, our goal is to help people live richer, more inspired lives. And to do that, we try and help people do things from everything from finding what they want to cook for dinner tonight to figuring out where they want to go on their next vacation or how they want to redecorate their home. So I'm specifically on the growth team. Uh, we're hiring for two engineering manager roles to help Pinterest grow internationally and reach more users. And I'm sure we're also hiring in a number of other engineering manager roles across the company. Hi, everyone. My name is Nikhil. Uh, I work at Cora. Our mission is to grow and share the world's knowledge. We fundamentally believe that a bulk of human knowledge is still trapped in our heads. We want to bring that to internet and make that accessible to everyone. And we believe that access to knowledge is upstream for a lot of other important decisions. And so this is really important, uh, I guess, for everyone to make good decisions everywhere. We have a bunch of management roles open uh, in machine learning engineering uh, and one for machine learning infrastructure as well. So if you're interested in any of those, please come talk to me. Thanks. Hi, I'm Lee Edwards, uh, CTO at Teespring, but I'm actually uh, pitching for a friend of mine. Um, so if, if you like this content, the idea of helping people become managers and leaders within their company, a friend of mine has a company called Sounding Board, uh, which just raised a round of funding and they're looking to bring on a lead engineer, engineering manager, VP engineering, whatever you sort of want to call it, um, who the, the, the company is basically trying to uh, help, help companies train their emerging managers through executive coaching. Um, and I spent two hours today with Christine, the CEO. Um, she's an awesome person and uh, has a great vision and is looking for someone to help her build it on the technical side. So come find me. Love to tell you more about it. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Amy Woodward. I work at FaunaDB, which is a transactional NoSQL database. Um, if you've heard of Google Spanner, we're kind of like that but um, in-house and cross-platform. We run on AWS and in-house and um, GCP, GCP as well. Um, yeah, we are hiring uh, managers in engineering in a couple of different areas. Um, come talk to me if you would like to know more. Um, we're definitely an organization that is looking to go and have the highest, <clears throat> the highest functioning management and executive team that we can. We uh, take this all very seriously and are very consciously trying to build a healthy organization. So let me know if you'd like to know more. Check out two and a half minutes. I won't take that long. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Peter Sinkowskis. I work for a company called Caffeine. Um, we're down in Palo Alto. If any of you uh, travel to get here, that might be an easier commute for you. Yeah. Um, so we're basically looking for a clone of Wade, um, someone that come in and knows how to more than double the size of the engineering team this year alone and probably double it again next year. Um, so if you have that sort of pedigree, please come and talk to me. That's fast. Hi, um, my name is Yun Kai, and uh, I'm a co-founder and CTO of a startup called Leap.ai. Leap. And uh, we are an AI engine trying to help people find jobs. 
So I have two pitches here. One, if you're looking for a job, sign up on leap.ai. Two, if you're hiring someone, go talk to us as well because we actually have the two-sided marketplace. Thank you. I guess that's, that's okay, one more. Hi, my name is Tom Elias. I work at a company called Anki. We're a robotics and AI company. Uh, right now we make toys, but we have some other plans. Uh, I run the cloud at Anki. We are looking for senior manager of DevOps to kind of grow that part of the business. We're also looking for other leadership roles in cloud. So if you're thinking even bigger, uh, come talk to me. I'm going to be over there. Hello, <clears throat> so folks. I'm Shamil. I work for a small uh, social media startup called Twitter. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm on the revenue side, so we're rebuilding revenue platforms right now. We need um, engine managers and engineers who are interested in scale, building uh, large-scale distributed systems. If you guys are interested in that, just come talk to me. Thanks. 30 seconds to go. All right. That's it. Cool. Um, so next, we're going to move into a panel discussion. So. I guess you'll learn a lot from Wiz talk that you've got to know the framework, know a lot of new, uh, new ways to think and how to find answers. So it may feel like awesome. So now you have everything you need to become a good manager. But I think the reality will be that, you know, after you start applying, you will you get frustrated and um, meet problems. So what could happen next is after enough number of, you know, frustrations or struggles, you probably come to a moment like finally realize something, there's those aha moments, right? And uh, typically behind those moments, there are some uh, mindset, mindset shift. That is how we think as a, as a leader, like perspectives. So, and this panel is going to focus on that to try to learn from uh, a few like four new leaders, uh, have re very rich experience to see what they learn along the way, what those are aha moments and what you can learn from, from them so you get no ahead of time. So um, we're going to welcome our uh, moderator and also the other panel guests. So first of all, we have Dan. Uh, Dan is a, a talent partner at Greylock and um, he has been fairly involved with the community and uh, helped us a lot. Actually, it's Dan that, who introduced me to it initially um, over a long time ago. So uh, really happy for him to uh, come here and, and also help us do the moderation. Um, so welcome Dan. Uh, yeah, we can, you know, have a, have a seat. And then uh, I'll give you, what's, where's the other mic? So this is, um, and we'll have um, Scott. I don't know where Scott. Yeah, Scott is uh, uh, if you're near at uh, Credit Karma. He has uh, been more supportive for our community as well. Um, they supported, they hosted two events and have given us one talk. And uh, Scott has been many of our events in the past. So I think he knows very well about the community and uh, what people care about. Uh, and next we're gonna have uh, Jessica. I'm not sure Jessica is here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, Jessica is a uh, uh, co-founder co and CTO at a pilot, a, a, a FinTech startup company. And uh, she was a uh, director of engineering at a job box before. So um, we talked over the phone one time and didn't, you know, the first time we knew in person. Um, and a fun fact is uh, Jessica is the technical advisor for uh, the show Silicon Valley. So if you don't know it. Uh, and next we're gonna have uh, Saren, so who just, uh, pitched you know, their, their positions. So Saren has a very broad range of uh, experience in the past from ISIS to uh, different leadership roles from, actually I, I remember you mentioned that you start looking to AI like 15 years ago, 10 years ago before it's become popular. So uh, I think he's gonna share a lot of interesting perspectives. Now last uh, guest on the panel is um, Nick who is, uh, we introduced a firm when we just started as a VP engineer at a firm. So let's welcome Nick. It's all yours, Dan. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I always love hearing Wade talk. Uh, I like to think I know a lot about management, and he always reminds me that I know shit. So it's, it's a good start. Um, 
So I, I'd just like to get in it and uh, have everyone kind of be a little bit vulnerable. So starting with um, kind of like your most memorable mistake as a manager, and, or maybe like you thought you had this manager thing all figured out and then you got thrown for a loop and how, and like, or maybe the thing that's kind of stuck with you most from, um, from a mistake. Totally. Many to choose from. Uh, one extremely memorable experience is the first time I fired someone because I didn't do it very well. Um, and it was one of those situations where I and the rest of the founding team, we, we had we'd committed to doing this and uh, I get the gentleman in front of me and we sit him down and I say that, you know, I, I sort of give him the news and he starts crying. And then I start thinking that I maybe wasn't as explicit as I should have been for the past several months about needing to improve and maybe I didn't document this as well as I should have and this person's crying in front of me and I would really like to retract this position somehow. We of course had to follow through with it, it was the right thing to do um, and he's off doing great things now um, in a place that's a better fit for him. But what stuck with me in that moment is that that happened very early in my management career and it, it, it was a good experience to remind me of how seriously to take every person and every moment and every interaction uh, and the first if you ever fire someone poorly, you will do a great job of it uh, every, every time in the future because you don't want to feel that way ever again. And that was like a good orientation in making mistakes as manager. Many other mistakes to talk about, but that, that was a, a, certainly a very memorable one for me. So I'll tell maybe a more recent one. So just a little background. So before, prior to Credit Karma, I was an engineering lead and manager of multiple teams at Google, and I was a startup founder. But uh, Credit Karma is the first time I really had to operate as a VP or as an executive. And so about a year into my tenure there, um, I had a team that was working on a really important company initiative, really critical uh, for revenue, and the team was having problems. And I was acting, you know, in the, that great manager guide for Google. I was trying to be supportive of the team and, you know, remove the roadblocks for them and give them guidance, give them coaching. And no matter what happened, they still were having challenges and the exec started, you know, getting upset about it. And about a month in, the uh, CTO pulls me into my office and he's like, this is, you know, you have to fix this problem or else I'll find someone who does. And I did something, you know, at the time, which seemed like crazy as a VP, I, cleared out my calendar. I spent the next six weeks like alongside the team in a room coding actually alongside them as a VP. Um, and we actually got, you know, sort of got out of that hole and shipped something about four months, about a month later, but we actually solved it. And I realized afterwards that I had been afraid almost of the perception. You know, the perception of a VP is this, you know, you're this leader from above who's always sort of giving your team guidance and coaching that I almost been afraid to like go back to, you know, operating like effectively as an IC to help my team out. I missed the point of your job as a leader is to make your team successful no matter what it takes. Um, and the other thing I realized that really drove home is that the leadership style uh, that, that's called for the, the, is different on the situation you're in. So there's times where, yes, you should be the leader who's giving them coaching and guidance and enabling them to succeed, but sometimes your team needs a leader who's actually in the trenches with them charging over the next hill. So it's really valuable for me. Great. Well, I've got a kind of a compliment to that story. And about the time that I thought that I really had this management thing down, uh, we, uh, we'd been through a few rounds of layoffs and things. And, and so I had a new team of people that I hadn't really worked with before. They were actually all a lot older than me, which you wouldn't guess now with all my gray hair, but they were. And, very, and more experienced, very experienced, strong senior engineers. And, and the mistake I made is really that I, I stopped listening. We were under a lot of pressure. We needed to get a release out. Uh, it was already running late. And I really thought I knew how we needed to do it. And, and, I, and I stopped listening to them, and I, but I didn't acknowledge that. I was a little bit inauth inauthentic in how, in how I presented it. You know, I'd, I'd listen, but I really kind of knew the answers. And of course, they saw right through it. And they ended up actually kind of revolting on me. And, and, and I had to, to go through a whole kind of group therapy session with them to really rebuild the trust. But what I learned is that, you know, you never really have it down. Uh, and, and you always have to be listening that the mindset of just being kind of open of, of really perceiving what's around you, what in the situation has changed, what worked before, but then isn't going to work anymore. Uh, it, you know, think really, really saying, okay, this is now a different situation. These are different people. This is a different project. And, and I have to adapt my strategy to that. And I really have to listen and genuinely not just put my problems in my, vision of how we're going to solve it ahead, but really accept what everybody else on the team can add. So I really like the firing story. <laughs> um, to add to that, I think to generalize it, it's um, the mistake that I was making for the longest time was avoiding being uncomfortable at work. 
I was coming in, I started managing a small team and it was three people. And uh, I would come to work and I kind of like what Wade was saying, you know, I come to work one day and now I'm a manager. And I continued doing what I'm good at. And then I started getting some management task. I was like, you know what, that's, I'm not really sure how to do is so continue coding, continue being an IC. And then all of a sudden I started getting feedback that, you know what, you're not, you're not a really good manager. So I sucked at that job, had to leave, went to another job. And uh, I realized, and this realization came very painfully, that you're supposed to be uncomfortable. Every day you come into work, if you want to grow, if you want to be a manager, you need to allocate time for conversation with people. You need to allocate time with coaching. You need to allocate time to all these four squares that uh, Wade was talking about. And um, I'll add the second example. The second example, as you start uh, spending time on this, as you start in being uncomfortable, the probably the biggest mistake there as you're going through the span is like, oh my God, there's all these new things I need to do. Um, you start you don't you don't have a framework of now you're the manager you're no longer doing hands-on work how are you going to ensure that the work that's no longer done with your hands is as good as you what you used to do when you did your your good work so establishing a framework you can trust and at the same time you can verify and be confident that the team is actually delivering what you told them to deliver um probably was going for a very, very long time, going through this painful process without the framework. And, you know, if I look back, what I wish to do first is just embrace the pain, embrace the discomfort. And every time when you go to work, just think about, have you done something that is extremely unpleasant today? And then I think you succeeded in becoming better. Great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about strengths and weaknesses. Um, I was at Mozilla pretty early, so I ran all of recruiting HR there from 20 people. You kind of notice as people go from each level that the strength at that previous level now becomes a weakness. And so um, for each of you, like if you particularly a weakness that you then got exposed at the next level, and then how much of your time do you spend addressing weaknesses versus focusing on your strengths? And you're welcome. Oh, and then one last thing is the panel should interrupt me and then be like, I'd rather ask, answer a different question. Like, yeah, moderate. <laughs> uh, uh, so I got to start. So, so the question is really how we've learned to focus on our strengths. Yeah, or it's like when you realize your strengths get exposed as you go from one level to the next. Or your weaknesses, your strengths get exposed as weaknesses as yeah. you go from one level to the next. Yeah, well, I think coming back to the point about m mindset, yeah, and maybe kind of what my comment was earlier about what worked in one situation is not guaranteed to work in the next. And it, you know, and to find, find the right level of openness to stay confident, that believe in yourself, back yourself, but, but also really be op open to seeing, well, what is new about the situation? And, and, and how does my behavior have to change in this new situation? So like an example for me was, you know, going from managing ICs to managing managers. It's a very different thing. Uh, you know, you have to give direction in a very different way. Uh, it is, you're framing things more in goals and you have to kind of up level uh, how, how you're working with people. So that is one example I can think of, of going from, you know, managing ICs to managing managers that takes that kind of shift and, and you, have to, you have to learn new strengths. You're, you're kind of starting over in a way. Another is going into like a VP role where your peers are no longer engineering. They're people from like across the business. They're in marketing, they're in sales. And suddenly you have to think about, well, how does my, you know, how's my organization perceived? How do, how do, the, how do they have confidence in what we're doing? Do they really, are, are we being transparent? Do they understand what we're doing? And then you're representing an organization. So that's another shift. So the, the most profound thing that has happened to me, and it's actually across my entire life, it happens to have been a work thing that has been the most profound experience of mine in the past four years, was a, an executive coaching program that I was a part of at Dropbox. Um, for a little bit of background on what my role, so I had two big roles at Dropbox. I, I, was, a, I was an engineering director and I, I ran the 140 person engineering product and design org that shipped all of our um, platform software, so desktop, web, mobile, and our internal and external APIs. And then I also uh, was in an operations role. Uh, so I had an operations team that rolled up to me, and then I was a strategic partner to the VPs of engineering and product and design. 
Um, and um, so I spent a lot of time with, with the executive team at Dropbox. Um, and because I was part of that group of people, it was, you know, we went through this executive coaching session and, and it was um, a really important experience for me. I and mean, so one on the, to answer the strength weakness question, the thing the my biggest memory about this is um, in going through this, there was a, like a 360 feedback component to this executive coaching program. And you get, so you had uh, like some of your reports and your, your peers and, and people above you would answer these really detailed, really detailed surveys um, about every possible dimension of you as a person and as a manager. And that feedback was uh, delivered to you in an anonymized, but in, in like a raw and aggregated day way. And it was a very... Um, like you cannot argue with data basically on, on like feedback about you as a person and as a manager. And what came out as a very clear theme in this feedback um, was something that I wouldn't say is surprising, but it was framed up in a way that was very useful to me, which is um, like you as a person operate on many dimensions. One of them is being on a support to a challenge, like a supporter to a challenger spectrum. Um, and the feedback was like, Hey, Jessica, you're really good at getting things done. Your team loves you. There are much other positive things, but you are way over here on the challenger side of the support challenger spectrum, especially with the executive team. So the people who like who who are above you in the organization. Um, and that was a really important thing for me to hear because being like an organizational rabble rouser, like being good at rallying a team around something worked really well as an engineer and as a manager and as a manager of managers and even as like an org leader, like as a director. But when it came to needing to get the executive team on board for big strategic initiatives, I, I needed to be spending more time creating space, like creating space and trust with them by being more on the support side of the spectrum before I could go into challenge mode. And that was really important to hear because I got a lot more effective once I was able to step back and make sure that I was providing that supportive environment to, to our v, the other VPs and the executive team. Um, and what's, when I said that this was like the most profound thing that's happened to me in my entire life, not just from in the business perspective is, as it turns out, I'm on that support challenge spectrum, like way on the challenge side, also in my non-work relationships. So like my husband has benefited tremendously from the fact that I've like introspected on this for the past several years. And, um, and I think it's important to say actually, because like who you are as a person gets reflected out into who you are as a manager in a really profound way. And especially as you, as you move up into these senior, like strategic roles where it's all about it's all about influence and like it's all about on a relationship of trust getting people to work together in a high functioning way like you're so far from like the actual execution at that point. It's all about the relationship that you're developing and it's all about breaking down those ineffective modes of operating in relationships to be a successful business person and that's true for your business relationships and it's also true for your personal ones. And that was a really profound thing for me to experience. I became a much better person and a much better manager and leader because of it. And I'm deeply grateful to have gone through that program to have had that outcome. So weakness for me, scotch too far on the challenging side, get swing that back towards the middle and like know when to be supportive and when to, you know, picking and choosing your battles. And that was a really profound thing for me. And I'm really glad I did it. Cool. Um, I was actually really, that's a hard act to follow. Um, so I think, I think there's a couple points that are always, that I always think about. So whenever you kind of make a transition in your career and take on a bigger role or bigger scope, you know, it is often the case that you are not really, you really, you're really in a position where you have to change, not just as like a, as a leader, but as a human being to be successful in a new role. And I think that's kind of touching on what you were saying also. It's you, like your strengths that you might've had that worked really well at the previous level. Now you find that you're they're a crutch or, you know, as way was saying, you're like act, acting the way you used to act the, in this sort of small role. Um, and there's a big process for recalibrating in that new level, figuring out how you can operate effectively. So sometimes it's worth like focusing on the most glaring faults or your, your biggest weaknesses and showing those up first before you start to take advantage of the strengths. But one thing that's really is really obvious is that the best leader, the best, you know, the role model for what you should be as a leader is not going to be out there in the world. You can learn from people who are out there, but you don't want to be a, a, a bad version of a wave. You want to be the best you you can be. So finding the way to sort of like 
the, what you need to do to compensate for your weaknesses, whether that's hiring people beneath you who can fill in those gaps or learning you know, ways around them and to uniquely leverage the strengths you have, you have to figure out what you, how you actualize as a leader. And that has to be redefined every time you kind of make a jump or transition in role. Yeah, I think I'm, I typically think about three, maybe four things when you make the transition and the bar is, the bar is higher. Thing number one is humility. Um, I like to just pause and reflect what just happened to me, right? I'm just, I'm in a different, uh, I'm on a different level. I'm now measured against different goals with different people. So being extremely humble about what just happened and reflecting, was it my skills, was it my motivation, or was it luck? I know a lot of you guys had different mix of these three factors as you, as you grow into become managers. So um, I think the weaknesses are actually your strength to a degree uh, when you humble and you kind of enter the new responsibility. Uh, the thing to realize is every time your responsibility increase, your human responsibility increase. You're dealing more with people, not less. So that's very important. And um, the, the other side of it is kind of the other coin of humility is empathy because you're going to find yourself in a place where, you know, now you've seen somebody else kind of stepping into the role that you were a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, right? And treating and creating the comfort zone where the people can be successful for the first time doing something they've never done before or doing something at the level of ownership that they haven't exerted before. Um, and the ownership is a big, big separate topic we can talk about, but there's, there's sort of this kind of reverse bell curve where when the company is tiny, right, and it's just you and the three guys that you, that you founded the startup with, right, the ownership is extreme. When the company is big and all the roles are very well defined and the functions are laid out, everybody owns each function to the extreme. But when you kind of grow in, when you maybe 60 people to 600 people kind of in this middle zone, the ownership gets diluted. And a lot of people come in as like, oh, you know, look at this, our, our team is too junior or our team is too senior. The, if you feel like this, that's the bell curve of opportunity, that hole, right? And stepping into that hole and realizing that you know, I probably shouldn't be bitching about this. You know, I probably, you know, shouldn't be complaining that all of a sudden, you know, I need to make calls for a whole bunch of people that I used to be peer with. That's an opportunity for you. And I think coming back to my original point, I think humility is kind of the first feeling to, to cultivate when you cross the line. Great. Jerry, I'm going to take an audience question next. If you want to pick someone while they or yeah, ask one more question, um, just wait, uh, keep rolling. So uh, at some point, like I'm sure when everyone starts as a manager, you kind of wing it. And so, and then it gets to a point where like, all right, I can't wing it anymore. And so I need either a role model or a framework or some system. So um, what's your system now? Or like, how did you come to develop that system? Yeah, so it sounds good. Um, so what's my system now? So I think that certainly that's changed over time. You know, as VP, you know, and I think this is true for everyone, as you move up, you get less and less feedback or signal that's just naturally there. You have to work harder to extract the signal from the environment to like learn how you're doing. Um, and I think the climb actually gets harder. You really have to be motivated to keep moving because there's so much intense change that you'll need to keep going through as you reach higher up. So for me, um, I kind of have a, a bunch of things that I look for to like trying to continue to grow and be successful. Um, you know, I'm pulling, you know, I have mentors and coaches. I'm pulling really strongly from peers. I'm reading books. I'm attending uh, conferences like these to try and get more signal on how I'm doing, talking to your own people and being reflective about that. A lot of us do tend to get, uh, start to think about sort of frameworks as well. So maybe a lot of, a lot of people here may have a favorite framework that they like. Um, the one that I'm focusing on right now, there's sort of twofold. One is there's a framework called STARS. If it was read first 90 days, it's a great book. But it's a framework that sort of talks about different leadership situations. Um, it's an acronym. S is for startup, T is for turnaround, A is for acceleration, R is for realignment, and S is for sustained success. But it's kind of like a design patterns for leadership situations. The, the, the thing that I like about it is, is kind of how I've been operating now recently is trying to be more explicit or disciplined about the leadership style that I have. So rather than just make decisions ad hoc, do them in a way that the organization can understand or be more, more um, rigorous about those decision making. So in that, you know, that framework, for example, if I look at a situation, rather than just being like, well, 
I'm going to shoot from the hip and, you know, gut instinct is what I should do. I should, I'm actually going to take a, a pause for a moment, think about the situation I'm in, what are the tools I need to apply, and then figure out a way to sort of teach that to my team. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've really got a, a system. I've got, you know, a number of things that I, that I do that I think I can apply in different situations. One is to, to always be learning and, and always be trying to, trying to learn something new. Like, uh, like uh, I'll take some, take some business school courses on Coursera or something to, to learn, learn accounting. Um, and, and that'll help you in various ways, at least stay active. Um, another is to try to find how to a, apply the right amount of pressure. You know, like you don't want to squeeze, you know, when you're working with people, you don't want to like squeeze things too tight and try to control it too much. But you don't want to be too loose either, because if you let things, you know, if you don't, if you don't impose kind of enough discipline and enough control, things can run off the white rails. So it's so 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 I think really about, well, what's the right amount of control uh, in this in a certain situation? Um, you know, a last thing that I, that I do is that uh, I, I try to triangulate feedback uh, from, from different people in different ways. Uh, like I, I regularly do uh, like skip level one-on-ones or I'll do uh, set up meetings with people and, you know, people in other roles in the organization and ask, well, how do you perceive my organization and what, what, what can I learn from that? And I found that I've been in different size organizations and the large organizations that can be, that can be, you know, re really important. Uh, and, and now I'm at, at MuleSoft, I'm in a company that not only is it has grown a lot since I joined about a year and a half ago, uh, it's much larger than an organization have been in recently. So that's been even more important. So a few ideas for my system. Um, I think the key word was situation that was just mentioned. So I don't, I don't remember the name of the framework. I think it might have been called situational leadership, but um, it's about leadership styles. So the framework that I use, kind of my mental framework, is dependent on the task at hand, what style is applicable, um, depending on what team you work with. Is it the time to lead from behind, uh, maybe be passive leader, just you know, let the folks discover their own mistakes for, let's say, a week of prototyping. That might be a good leadership and, you know, give an opportunity to sort of be free. Do you want to be prescriptive because there is a timeline and, a, you know, and a pressing deadline and you have to get things delivered and you can't afford um, to fail and you must be prescriptive? Do you want to be inspirational? Do you want to give a couple of challenging problems to solve, inspire people to solve them? Or do you want to be very hands-off and be visionary, just set the goals. So to me, like every, literally every day, several times a day, uh, you can exercise this discretion to constantly stop myself, take a long breath, and in the meeting that I'm going into, like what should be done, like what, what kind of leader do I want to be? And finding this, you're going to find very interesting things about yourself and about the people you're dealing with and where does it work, where it doesn't work, and what situation and with what kind of people. But uh, do not be prescriptive all the time. <laughs> Very, uh, that's pretty obvious, but uh, um, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good trick to do to yourself several times a day. The only thing I'd add to this is just to, to riff on something that you said, feedback somehow man manages to magically disappear as you go up the org chart in most organizations. Like we spent a, we put a bunch of effort into like performance review frameworks and templates and like making sure that numbers are really assigned to like the ICs doing really concrete work. And I guess because it's like kind of harder to measure and also because the people who are setting up the frameworks probably would prefer not to be judged if they could avoid it. Like somehow like feedback kind of dies as you go up the org chart and it's on us to resist that and to like push back when that happens and to insist that like we that feedback is important for us to grow as leaders. And so you should help the organization have good discipline about this. This actually applies both like in the, like in, in the context of performance reviews and, and just like feedback interactions with, with your peers, with your manager, with your one-on-one, -on -one, with your reports, um, but also actually with hiring. I find that a lot, of, a lot of the rigor that we apply towards like IC roles in, in like an evaluation process often dies as you go up the vine. I've, I was uh, the, the, like the main debrief moderator for all of the executive hires at Dropbox and it, um, Dropbox had great people in it, but it was like, it was amazing how we went from like these incredibly like rigorous rubrics and evaluation criteria for ICs towards like super fuzzy, just like we conversed with the person and decided that we liked him or her. 
um, at the executive level. We got better at this over time, but like help instill organizational discipline about evaluation everywhere in the org, not just for the people um, doing the actual <laughs> concrete work. Uh, audience question? How do you man how do you once you step up in your career, how do you manage your peers who are or people who were your peers before, but now you are managing them? So what kind of challenges have you faced individually since you've obviously grown to executive positions uh, at your places? Yes, sir. Um, it's kind of back to what I what I was talking about, the style, what when you find yourself all of a sudden in charge of folks that you've been working with is finding the right style of interaction based on goals, right? So to me, the, the goals didn't change, right? You, you just have an appointment, you've been appointed to the new role. Uh, the goals are the same. The, the responsibilities potentially, so the, to me, the growth really is ownership growth, right? So when you, when you step up, you now are accountable and you now are responsible a little more. Right, so people uh, who are a little bit more junior than you might kind of want to rest in the comfort, right, that you know what you're doing and sometimes that's not the case. So you need to establish sort of the mode of operation to um, find the way where, uh, where you can delegate. Um, uh, one particular thing that one, one of my most famous mentors used to tell me uh, whenever you take the new role, find your takeout person immediately. I was like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm gonna be doing this for two years. Like, what, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, you, ha you have to find someone. It doesn't have to be one person. You have to find who you will be grooming, who you'll be mentoring, who can take you out. This is a very important exercise for yourself because you do a lot of self-analysis. You actually analyze every day in order to grow this person, what do you need to do? professionally as a human being, as a owner of the organization, um, and you become a good mentor, you become a good role model as a result of it, as effectively taking a very direct mentorship uh, responsibility over you know, one or two people that you think could be playing your, um, your role maybe two years down the line, but you have to decide it very early on, because then you don't, right? There's obviously, as managers, we're dealing with a lot of attrition, we're dealing with a lot of change, right? If we, if we can't deliver a project because we had three people quit and five new people join the team, we, we're not good managers, right? We need to deliver no matter what happens with the teams. Uh, there could be your sort of microeconomic reasons. You know, the company is not paying well, is not doing well financially. It could be microeconomic reasons. The, the whole industry is crashing, right? Uh, you need to ensure that um, as a team, as an organization, you uh, find a way to um, kind of take this new ownership opportunity, right, and instill it in the people that at some point, you know, you'll be doing my job, I'll be doing the job of my manager. So um, to me, is establishing these relationships is very important as you step up. Yeah, it's, it, it kind of depends on, on if the other people on your team were also vying for the same job that, that you got and then they didn't. Um, so I've had that happen. So certainly when, when nobody else wanted the job and you were the guy who got promoted in and stuck with it, that's not an issue. But and in that case, you know, that's happened, you know, once or twice and, and, you know, you talk to the other person, you know, how are they feeling about it? But then also see, well, you know, what can I do to kind of help them in their, in their career? And, and in one case, I was able to help them get a promotion into a role on another team. So yeah, it's been a little while where that's happened directly, but I can, there's sort of two kind of ways that I usually see this play out. Uh, some people, if, especially if you're first time, the first time you're promoted, you know, among your peers and you become, start to manage them. Some people are, do the weight approach, maybe where they're the very first time managers and they be basically like drive their team crazy because they start, you know, ordering them around. And some people have the reverse problem where they're like, they want to keep the same buddy-buddy relationship they have with the team before, but the relationship has changed. So I think you have to acknowledge that the relationship is no longer the same. You are, as the manager, accountable for these people and, and for their actual growth um, and the overall team success. Um, so if, if you keep that in mind, you know, that often helps uh, focus your efforts. So you can think about like, I'm managing someone now, 
but my job is to make them successful. My job is to actually grow them, you know, and if, if they're willing to go along with you with that, if they trust you, if they, they believe in you, that's really easy. If you have a case where someone was vying for the same position, you may not be able to help them as a manager, and then they may not be the right person for your team. The main thing I want to add on this, um, with all due respect to the panel, is um, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't consider moving into a management role as a promotion. This should be considered a lateral transition. People would have a very high degree of impact as ICs as well as as managers. They're distinct, they're distinct roles with distinct focus areas that allow the organization to be successful. Um, so, so first, let's keep that in mind. Um, and, and, and second, like within that framing, like why do we have managers or why do we have PMs or why do we have designers or why do we have any function? It's like there's a well-defined set of responsibilities that work together in concert with a bunch of other roles to get the job done. So, so hopefully there's a lot of trust and credibility that comes with everyone buying into that like managers add value and ICs add value and PMs add value and we're all working together. And, um, and hopefully the focus can be on that and not like jockeying for things that do or don't feel like promotions. It's like about us collectively supporting each other and moving the organization forward. Great answer. Um, there's something tactical that I actually wanted to talk about because I'm sure everyone that will run into this problem at some point. Um, there's the, the getting everyone to like disagree and commit versus disagree and relitigate. Like when you're an executive, you're like, all right, you're either on board, I can fire you. When you're not an executive, like there's other levers that you need to be able to pull in order to kind of get get people to disagree and commit. And so I was wondering if anyone had comments that they'd like to, because I'm sure I saw a bunch of head shaking when I said that, so. Yeah, I guess it's, it, there are different types of decisions and, and you wanna make them in different ways. If, you know, so, some, some decisions are just very execution focused. Well, we've gotta do this thing, in which case, you know, you may decide, okay, I'm just gonna just decide it as the leader of this organization and, People might object once or twice, but, you know, eventually they're just going to have to do it. But then there are other things that are not going to be successful unless, there, unless there's buy-in from the team. Uh, those are things like shifting people's mindset, you know, adopting a new way of working, uh, getting people to work together in a different way. And those you need to build the support for. You need to take more time. You need to accept, and, the, and you know, and I made this mistake many times, you can't just try to railroad it through. I mean, you have to accept that it's going to take time to get people comfortable with that change. And, and, and then you're not so much in how to roll out a decision, but actually how to roll out. It, it's kind of a change management sorts of program. And that's where you really need to, to you know, you need to, uh, and there are methodologies on change management, you know, do people understand, get, recognizing that there's a problem, you know, getting through the helplessness of it, believing in, in the solution. Uh, so it's, it's, again, it's situational. And sort of doubling down on that, um, if, um, so if, if some decision is being made, if people feel like they were able to make their voice heard and considered, if people feel like they under, there's transparency about the motivation behind the decision and there's trust in the leadership, you usually disagreeing and then committing is, is it, they, they usually happens. It usually works if you have those ingredients. And so if people are disagreeing and not committing, it, it typically speaks to some sort of um, concern over a lack of transparency about decision-making or a lack of trust in leadership. And those are like more fundamental issues that need to be addressed to get to, to be able to get over that, like the specific hurdle of that specific decision. I'll, I'll tackle one other aspect you mentioned, situation. So I think there are situations where, you know, like if something's on fire, the classic turnaround situation, and they really, people are looking, and people know it's a problem across the organization and they're looking for a leader for an answer. It's very easy to get people to sort of come along, get behind you and get behind the decision if you have the answer. But if you have a situation where people aren't aware that there's a problem or aware that there's a need for change, then it's, it's, it requires a lot more work. You have to realign the organization. So that requires change management, evangelization, and you know, often going to grassroots, going to the individual people who are you know, really powerful in the organization from a cultural standpoint and using them as evangelists. So it requires a lot more deliberate effort to make the change happen. You can't do it necessarily very fast. Um, and if you make a decision that's, if you try and rush a decision through that's deeply unpopular, you know, and people don't understand why it's there, you're gonna have a lot of blowback, even if there is, even people, uh, the process is transparent, people don't believe fundamentally with the decision. It, it's like, a, for example, a major cultural change, you're gonna have problems. You have to take those more slowly. Uh, take a, another audience question. Yeah, please.
not come from here. Well, maybe you have modern tools that you're not really going to figure out what they are. So how else would you, what, what are your options to help them get to this point? I think at the end of the day, my team needed someone who f was feeling the pain with them and was in the situation that they needed. Um, I think the coding was a bonus. I think they basically needed someone who could feel like the, thing, the site's on fire and the, the VP can't do anything, but he's sleeping under the desks with the rest of the team and ordering the food and making sure that they're taken care of. So that aspect of camaraderie is often one powerful one you can use as a leader. Yeah, just to add to that, it's basically FaceTime, right? You have to, you have to be there even if you, you, know, you don't know the code base. You trying to help with questions, you're trying to slow down, you're trying to extract opinions from people. So to, to kind of relate it to the previous question, the, a lot of times the biggest challenge is to make people voice their opinions. It's not that there, you know, there might be nothing to agree with, only one person uh, suggested something and you rush in to, to fix it, actually slow it down and make sure to defer your opinion as a manager to be last or maybe not even voice it so that the team can feel that they came up with the solution and then you know, disagreeing and committing from the manager perspective could be actually a silent process, right? You're disagreeing internally, you commit into what your team decided and you're supporting them along the way. I think that's very key. Uh, another question? Yeah, so, so, so the question is, is around uh, skip levels, making them effective because often you don't get, yeah, you, you won't get the direct feedback. People don't feel maybe as comfortable in the, in the skip level and, and they're kind of just, you know, either telling you what it, I, I'm assuming you, they're filtering a bit. And so, so how can you, how can you get, get it to be more authentic? And, and one is in some ways to try to do, you can try to do them informally. You can kind of, you know, it's, it, it's important to try to get to know everybody in your organization, you know, so the people that you're doing the skip level with, they should already know you and have some level of comfort, you know, interacting with you. Um, and, uh, and then what, one thing I do when I do skip levels is I'll have sort of a standard set of questions that work them way, work, work the way to getting kind of more open, you know, like, talking about what they've been doing, the most interesting project, then you start to get into the, the, the bits of, of uh, organization that, that you wanna surface. And also sort of declaring kind of a safe zone as well. And you can do that in different ways, but really saying, hey, you can ask me anything. And if, if you don't want it shared or whatever, I won't take notes, won't write it down. And trying to create a, 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 a safe zone as well. It's a little challenging, it's not perfect, but, and you can get a lot, not in formal skip levels, but in just you know, various, uh, various interactions. Uh, you know, informal interactions, you know, social activities with the team. To me, that's like one example of just like the broader challenge of you have to have organizational credibility and people have to feel comfortable being honest with you. And how do you cultivate that as a leader? Um, it takes a lot of work. It's, I mean, it's like you, you present yourself as accessible through how you comport yourself in your one-on-ones and in the team meetings and when you're up in front of the company and you um you prove yourself that you that you you have like you have the best interest of the people and the teams and the company um at heart because you've you've like put yourself out there or stood for things that matter to the organization or matter to the individuals and you followed up on your promises like i mean you you spend your whole career like following through on commitments and like demonstrating that you care about people so that when you need to have these conversations, they're willing to have them honestly. It's not like I have no short answer to that, except that that's like one example of like the broader challenge of having organizational credibility and trust. Um, so uh, I think that's a great answer. In a lot of cases, like uh, if you run an organizational survey and you gather feedback and you're like, here's what the survey said, and then you don't do anything with it, then people no longer commit. So if you go out and you ask for feedback and you get the feedback and then you don't do anything with that feedback or you don't explain why you're not acting on that particular piece of feedback, 
then you won't get any more feedback. You're like, cause it doesn't matter. This person is not going to act on anything that I give them. And so being able to then have this, like ask questions, make promises, deliver on those promises will then get people to continue to talk to you and open up on things that are difficult. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about people that you're, you either have developed in the past or are currently developing that you think have the potential to be, you know, VPs in the future. So, um, the most common like barrier from re for reaching that or like the most common derailer that you see in helping people actually like hoping that they'll achieve or have achieved that level. Anyone want to start? Yeah. So if you're developing people, yeah. So um, I think this depends on like how long and how many people have you've kind of run through promotion cycles. Like there's usually a common thread on what causes people not to reach that next level. And so if you have a common one that you see that either help people work on or like what it is to actually help people get past that. Look, it's honestly, it gets, it gets harder the higher up you go. Uh, if someone, if you don't have, you know, this is what generally happens. If you don't have a really strong growth mindset, you will not, you'll eventually level out. No matter how talented you are to start, that gets you so far. At some point you hit a wall of, all the things that maybe were idiosyncrasies when you were an engineer or you know even a manager or senior manager they start to become hindrances as you go up um there's a, things are strengths that carry with you too so if you don't if you don't have the will to actively work on yourself and change yourself you're not going to keep progressing so if you don't have that growth mindset that requires you know introspection and reflection and honesty you know and that's what i would look for often in the people who are really high potential they really have that and they're they really want to change and get better yeah, I think it's a combination of, of drive and willingness to kind of really push and keep after something, persistence, but also, you know, self-awareness. And I also think like for VPs, I mean, they're different, different types. Some are very kind of people process, others are, are technical, and others are maybe more product oriented. And you can be, you know, you can be good in all of those camps, but you have to kind of recognize for a person, you know, which one they're going to be and make sure that they put the right, you know, they're going to need to understand that and put the right people around them to, to be successful. Yeah, I think to add to that, it's just hard work. You very, very clearly see hard working people. Um, and people who typically know whose who's job they want, who can point in the organization and say, I want this person's job, I'm working hard, these are my goals. You can have a discussion around the goals. Uh, the, um, also, just to add to the skip level question before, the, uh, uh, in the skip level discussions, uh, probably kind of got the revelation about some of the folks who have extremely high potential. I had, you know, a few people come to skip levels with well-written agenda, asking questions about my job. Right. And what, what am I losing sleep over and how is what I'm doing is connected to your goals? Like what's more important to you? I want to make sure I'm working on the things that actually matter and they can steer this it's effectively self steering their career. A lot of times we're in the situation where we're not actively being promoted. So an ability to have this drive to have this motivation is uh, I think is what helps people most to get to the next levels. I also just want to share a story, which is that um, uh, the person who was here, there was a person here earlier named Matt who um, uh, moved into a manager role under me at Dropbox, and he's about to leave for Cincinnati next week to go be the VP of engineering at a tech company, uh, which is awesome. And we're going to go carry the at the Mint together uh, on Wednesday to celebrate. And there's, it, watching people grow is just like, for me at least, is like the most satisfying part of the job, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, so I'm super proud of Matt, and I wish him the best in Cincinnati. Um, and then just, this is not really an answer to your question, but feels important to say. It's actually, it's pretty hard to fake your reputation in the long term. Like you, you develop a reputation from your day-to-day -day interactions with people and how you treat them um, like every day at work. And that reputation follows you from company to company. And it's just, it gets pretty hard to fake being like being a good person or like being good at what you do because your reputation fought, like your, your reputation has, a, has like a very long memory that you can't get rid of. And I think what that speaks to is like, it's really important to take seriously, like treating people well and like 
winning as per the slides from earlier, but like winning in a way that is really doing right by the people around you and by the organization. Because if you win, but in a way that had like negative impact on other people, that, that shit sticks with you for forever and it's just not worth it. Um, and and text a small world. And text a small world and people know how to do ref checks and they will. So be a good person because actually it's the only way to really be successful. You mentioned self-awareness and like that is the, the hardest thing that I think it is to teach. Like it, I, I, have, uh, I have not found a good way of helping people kind of learn how to become self-aware. And I don't know if it's a, it's a function of age or time or, or having enough pain that you finally are like, okay, I can't go through this over and over and over again. So it causes you to kind of be more uh, aware of, of kind of where you are as a person and as a leader and learning how to be vulnerable with those things. Um, so I, we have, couple more minutes. So this is the last question. I'm sorry that I didn't get to get more questions from the audience, but um, what would you tell you earlier in your career that would have saved you the most amount of like pain and suffering and discomfort if you had known that earlier in your career? This is like a little bit of a quip answer, but I think it, it actually, there's something behind it that, that's very real. Um, as, the, as the way and like on the challenging side of the spectrum, as someone who's been a rabble rouser, and I, I have to really pull myself back from that, the thing that I've had to learn, like I would say that I spent my, I will probably, so I spent all of my 20s and will probably spend all of my 30s continuing to work on having a short memory. And, and what I mean by that is to have a short memory for the bad stuff and also for the good stuff. So for the bad stuff, if you get in a fight with your co-founder or you really screwed up a project or a person who you really needed to stay on the team and you worked really hard to retain them, they still quit on you and it feels really bad, you have to get, you have to get good at having a short memory about that and like coming back to work the next day. Like, firing on all cylinders and still being excited about the team and about the mission. Like you just, you cannot sweat the small setbacks or you will get exhausted by doing that. And then you also have to have a short memory about the good stuff. So like, it's great when, when you raise a round or when you, you have that product launch or you hire that person. Um, but you have to keep earning your reputation with the team and you have to keep hungry about driving the business forward and you, you sort of can't rest on your laurels about the successes either if you want to stay effective and you want to keep moving as quickly as you as you want to be so i had to really train myself to have a short memory and in particular to like not hold grudges um to be as effective as possible so have a short memory would be the advice that i would give my younger self so tell a little story um when i was 18 uh and i was going to college i was thinking about being a doctor my dad's a doctor and he, he said, Scott, you know, let me give you some advice. You know, first of all, you know, being, going to medicine is rough these days, like, you know, with malpractice and insurance and everything. Also, you're terrible with people, so you'd be a terrible doctor. <laughs> you know, and of course, I was la laughing about that now. So I think the advice I give to my younger self and I think to all of you is that you are only limited by what you think you're capable of do doing. A lot of being a leader is, is in your own head. So constantly push against what you think your limits are and almost everything that Wade shows and Wade, Wade talks about it, almost all that can be learned, it can be taught. Almost everything that, that's there, there's skills you can develop even if you don't have them today. So don't feel like you're limited because, oh, I'm not good with people, I'm not a good public speaker, I'm not good at inspiring teams, whatever, I don't know how to read people, all that can be learned. So don't ever let yourself be limited. So, so I think the, the biggest single thing for me is you know, acknowledging that there is a problem somewhere and then dealing with it immediately, no matter how painful it is. You know, so that could be a person who's not working out. That could be, you could be in a, like on a growth trajectory like this and your ser service is not going to scale. But whatever it is, you know, don't deny it. Don't try to look the other way because it's painful. You know, you'll, you'll get signals that there's a problem. So acknowledge it and deal with it. Thanks. Um... I think if my younger self uh, realized that what I paid thousands of dollars at university for is going to become my hobby, I'd probably give myself an advice and become a manager and what I'm coding, what I really, really enjoy doing is effectively I only have time during my hobby time because I don't get, don't get to do at work as much as I wanted to. 
um, and to tell another story, kind of realization about what your profession entails and the risks associated with your profession, especially when you get to become a manager and you think you're doing super important things. And my wife and I were flying um, on a Boeing 747, a big plane, there's a lot of people sitting in front of us from Italy back to New York. And uh, we saw people, a person started having a cardiac attack in front of us. And the, uh, the stewardess picked a microphone and said, there are doctors on the plane. Here is the cardiac set. Um, we, need, we need to help the person. And there are three doctors. There's one dentist, uh, one general doctor, and actually one turns out to be a cardiac doctor. And they went in and they saved this person in front of us. And he was sitting. And the, the three people with really good personal skills were sitting around that person and making him comfortable. And my wife turns to me and she's also a software engineer. And she's like, imagine they now say on that, we have a bug with the <laughs> navigation system. Uh, other software engineers out there. She's like, just a perspective. It's okay. Nobody's going to die. So the advice I'm going to get, whatever you're going to be doing in your life, it's all right. We're not doctors. <laughs> Thank you, guys.